We're back, baby. Welcome to the Breakaway Podcast. I'm your host, John Root, right next to this guy. Wow, that's a cute microphone, Brian Farnsworth. <laughs> Thanks. You know, uh, really glad I got put behind the Alex Clark spillover mic today. Wow. No, I thought you were kind of getting into the trans movement. I <laughs> thought you were going to be like, yeah, you know, after seeing what happened this weekend, go Leah. You know what, John? Um, actually, no, I, got, I got a great take on this, but I'm going to let you I'm going to let you kick it off. All right. So for those of you that don't know, I was out at Georgia Tech. Uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, for the NCAA Division I Women's Swimming Championships because I knew Leah Thomas was going to be competing. So I'm like, we need to be boots on the ground, and I want to know what is actually happening firsthand. And it was wild. Like, right when I showed up, so we weren't able to get tickets beforehand. Initially, too, we tried to get a media pass, but that was denied. Not really much of a shocker there because I think the NCAA obviously – they're the ones that need to be held accountable for this absolute nonsense, allowing a biological male to compete against women mm-hmm. who have worked their whole life to get to the national championships. But right when I showed up, didn't have a ticket, so I'm like, all right, I just want to interview the protesters from both sides. I talked to Save Women Sports, a lot of great women there that are doing some incredible work, doing the Lord's work to make sure people understand that there's only two genders and that what's going on here, we live in America – Change your name. Be whoever you want to be. John, but how can you say that? You're not a biologist. Oh, my gosh. I know. I'm also not a mechanic, but I do know what a car is. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I know we need to touch on um, another person that I met there, a UK uh, activist, and she actually had an interaction with somebody. It's like, well, you're not a biologist. How can you tell me what a woman is? It's like, I'm not a vet, but I can tell you what a <laughs> dog is. But right when I showed up, Save Women Sports, chatted with them. And they want people to know, like, this is more than just Leah Thomas. Mm -hmm. This is about women's sports for generations to come. And right now what's happening here, it needs to be fought with every ounce of our being. And in America, like I was saying, too, it's like change your name, be who you want to be, but know that there is a biological advantage that Leah has over the rest of the swimmers. Then I went to the other side because for me, I think the only way we bridge the gap and get to some sort of understanding is by actually talking to people. And that's what I don't agree with some comments when I was talking to the Leah Thomas supporters. Like, why would you even talk to these imbeciles? Why would you ever, you know, spend your time doing this? I was like, well, because people need the truth. Mm -hmm. And people hate truth right now. That's pretty evident and clear. Well, and also another thing is it's just like it's really easy for, you know, those of us that, you know, think more on the conservative side of things for us to – you know, have our opinions on it. And we sometimes forget exactly what the arguments that the regular people, I'm not talking to people, the the, the blue checks you read on Twitter or what, what, you know, a WNBA athlete, you know, tweets about the Leah Thomas situation. It's great to remember what the boots on the ground, what the regular people and remembering like there's a lot of division and, and very basic stuff between one side and the other. Yeah, it is. It's very sad. It's actually like very depressing to hear some of the responses. But I know we have a video of that when I was talking to the Leah Thomas supporters. Give you that. I think we got that set back there. If you guys just let me know we got the okay, we'll send that clip, and then I'll give you a little response. But Is it the guy or the girl? So this is the girl. Okay. So the guy I, I think was my favorite one. Yeah. So I know if you – have not checked out any of these videos you can go at johnny root underscore j-o-n-n-y-r-o-o-t underscore and i mean i'm asking pre- pretty simple questions so check out this clip do you feel like there's a biological advantage that leah has over the other swimmers in there i feel like if i jumped in that pool right now a lot of the women would have a biological advantage over me <laughs> but specifically leah i think that leah is competing in a college swimming uh, competition as a woman, as she should. And if she wins, then good for her. So on your side of the aisle then, would you say that anybody that was going from uh, whatever amount of time on the men's team, they can switch over to the women's team at any point, and that's good as long as they feel like they're a woman now? We believe that, um, or I'll speak for myself, I believe that trans women are women, and women should compete with women since there's two categories right now. So right now, then, would you believe that there's two genders? Um, I don't agree with that, no. So if there's not two genders, and right now we just have two genders separating, we got men's sports and we got women's sports, you think anybody, it's how you feel, 
I feel like a woman tomorrow, I can go compete in women's sports. That That's your feeling right now. If you're a woman, you should be able to compete with women. Woo! And if you're a man, you should be able to compete with men. And Leah Thomas is a woman. So tell me this. If Michael Phelps all of a sudden was saying, I, I feel like I've been a woman the whole time and I'm going to start competing at the Olympics and go against people like Katie Ledecky and that that's who I am now, that would be okay with you? I would say good for her. Well, there it is, ladies and gentlemen. I know we're going to bring in Jake Crane from Crane & Company, the brand new sports show at Daily Wire in just a second, but I want to give you a response to this. Mm -hmm. I, I know I ended up asking her later, like, explain to me what is a woman? I said, well, um, and then also in that clip, you see, like, so would you agree that there are two genders? Because right now we have men's sports and we have women's sports. And once again, I chatted with these people for an hour. An hour long, I was telling them these aren't like gotcha moments. These aren't like I hope – that we just have some viral footage that is at your expense. I actually want to get down to the truth. I explained yeah. that to them because I know we even had a security guard that came over and said, you know what, all day long, there's been a lot of back and forth. So on one side, close to the Macaulay Aquatic Center at Georgia Tech, there was a Save Women's Sports. On the other side, you saw these individuals that were supporting Leah Thomas. And that security security guard said, that's the first time I've seen both sides come together all day long. They'd been there since the early morning making sure that they had their voices heard on both sides. And I think we made a little bit of progress, but it is unbelievably depressing to hear something like that. Or it's like, this is basic biology. Well, and it's stuff that's been widely accepted for 6,000 years of humanity. And like, what is a man? What is a woman? That's, that's an easy question. But you, you don't have to go past the first chapter in the Bible <laughs> to find out that they were made male and female. It's just it's just bonkers. Like if you're on the side that can't doesn't have a simple definition for what a woman is, I don't know how you how you justify any of the next rational thoughts coming down. But they're not rational, so that's the problem. Yeah, it is. It's wild. But I know we're going to be posting a few more of those clips. So stay tuned. We're going to put those on our YouTube. A little bit lengthier version. I know I did a vlog while I was out there doing all this editing, but we're trying to get some of those clips out there for you. I know some of these clips went to the absolute moon. Oh, yeah. And uh, one, one more thing I say before we bring on Jay Crane is I called it. I said that they were going to call Leah Thomas some sort of trailblazer like Jackie Robinson, Willie O'Ree, Lucia Harris. I posted that as a reel on IG. And then you know what happened? There was an opinion piece posted that said that we should be celebrating Leah Thomas as we did Jackie Robinson. That's what they want you to think. I know for people watching, we have that in the back here. And the title of that article is for everybody listening. Leah Thomas's NCAA championship performance gives women, women's sports, a crucial opportunity. Anyone who cares about the advancement of women's sports, good God, and women's sports in particular, should celebrate her win. This is unfair. 100%. And this is like, Jackie Robinson couldn't do anything about the color of his skin. Mm -hmm. Leah Thomas, after three years on the men's team, decided, nah, I just kind of feel like a woman. <laughs> that's it. I, 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 I'm a woman. I'm going to go join the women's team. That's not Jackie Robinson. This person should not, not be celebrated. Leah Thomas is breaking barriers in a massive negative way. Jackie Robinson, Willie O'Ree, and these other real sports trailblazers broke barriers in an incredible way. We watch 42, and everybody comes together like, wow. You know what? That's actually real courage. That's something where they're actually get, they're getting death threats. They're making the game better, and they're bringing the country together. Jackie Robinson did that. Willie O'Ree did that. Leah Thomas, this is another crazy woke ideology that – Places like ESPN are pushing Big and time. backing, and it's dividing us. And it's also lying to us. That's the final thing I'll say about Leah Thomas is I watched Leah throughout the event. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see, like, wow, Leah had the headphones on. Uh, was there an interaction between the coaches, maybe some of the teammates, uh, other swimmers? The body language there? is important there. Nobody was interacting with Leah, and Leah wasn't interacting with anybody else. The most interaction I saw was after, I think it was the prelims for the, it might have been the 200-yard freestyle. Uh, Leah ended up beating another swimmer, and they, like, high-fived. Okay. And it might, it might have been the 500-yard. But Well, the biggest bummer is, like, you know, I, I, you know, 
we we pray for Leah. We we want um, we want Leah to get all the all the help. And and honestly, uh, you know, people think I'm hateful for saying this, but the extensive amounts of therapy that that Leah probably needs. Uh, we don't like look on breakaway. We don't have hate in our hearts for for Leah Thomas. We just say this isn't fair. We're calling a spade a spade, and we hope Leah gets all the help that that she needs. Exactly, and that that's what I say too. Is like people aren't doing anything to help Leah by perpetuating this lie. Yeah, and supporting it. It's it's not helping out Leah. If you really want to love somebody, you tell them the truth. And that's, and that's hard. But I think we got Jake Crane on the line. To tell us the truth about March Madness. Come on. Come on. We got him on the line. J We're going to get Jake on in just a second. I'm excited because I know we wanted to get Jake on just about a couple weeks ago when they first launched Crane & Company with Daily Wire. Their set looks baller, too. They got three great guys that do incredible work. And I know they've been going in on March Madness and making sure everybody's fired up because, man, we've seen a lot of upsets. We got the Sweet 16 coming up starting tomorrow, and I know with with our brackets, it doesn't it doesn't look too shabby, but it also doesn't look too good. I would at least speak for myself, Brian. It, it's hilarious. Half of my bracket looks like I'm a genius. It's a real Jekyll and Hyde situation <laughs> because on, on literally one half of my bracket, I think the only one, yeah look the only one I have wrong is St. Peter's, and nobody in America outside of outside of the kids' moms, Doug's mom had St. Peter's going that far or the other side the only thing I have correct you know make it as, as it goes to elite eight is is potentially Arizona I but the other half of my bracket is just busted absolutely destroyed but um so yeah Jekyll Mr. Hyde yeah and then for mine too I have uh I called Gonzaga and Arkansas got both those right actually everything in the west I got I got spot on um and I only yeah, I had Virginia Tech beating, uh, uh, going to the Sweet 16, but obviously Purdue's able to do it. I told you guys before, they are the top scoring team in the nation, but they're one of the worst defensive teams in the mm -hmm. nation. So it's going to be an absolute wild ride. They're playing St. Peter's, who is the Cinderella story. And I love what their coach had to say. Like, we got a bunch of boys from New York and New Jersey. Like, we can, we can take on anybody. It, it doesn't yeah. matter. And I, I love their mentality. I love that mentality because they have this mentality where we got we got nothing to lose. We're the 15th seed. We, yeah. just, we just took out Kentucky. Like, we don't care who we go against. We're going we're gonna to ball out, and no one's going to push us around. Well, you love to see it. Did you see Doug just signed a NIL deal with, with Buffalo Wild Wings? <laughs> I just saw that. So this, I mean, hey, this has been a life-changing tournament for Doug. <laughs> it's been amazing. But right now, we're going to bring in Jake Crane from Crane & Co. from the Daily Wire, brand new sports show over there. Jake, what's going down? What's up, guys? Sorry, I had a little technical difficulty. You know, I'm, I'm no Steve Jobs or Alan Turing, <laughs> so I uh, appreciate you guys bearing with me. Incredible hat she got on. Save Abuela. Appreciate it. We <laughs> did did, uh, it. did ben, uh, ben or Matt give you that? Man, it was a, a gift for coming over here. Uh, you know, they got a bunch of good merch, and we're actually about to launch a, a merch line of our own, so they got a bunch of good stuff. And I wore it last time. I, I came out on Instagram Live, John, so I thought I'd rock it again, man. I had a great time last time. Let's go. Yeah, well, definitely glad we could get you on here live. And for everybody, too, if you're watching right now, make sure you press that like button. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of this great non-woke sports content every single week. But, Jake, tell us, how's your bracket doing right now? Well, uh, you know, it, when I think about my bracket, the way it's going right now, I kind of think about the Columbia shuttle mission. Um, that's about <laughs> oh, the way gosh. it's going. Uh, too soon, maybe. It's uh, go gone down, and I will say I have Texas Tech in the Final Four. I got Arizona winning it, but I would like to take this opportunity to tell Iowa, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Auburn, I'll never forgive you. Seriously, because I know for me, Tennessee was my dark horse. I thought Tennessee, especially after winning the SEC championship, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. they were going to keep rolling. And I thought, you know, I feel like it's similar to the Gonzaga. Everyone's like, well, you know, they're due. Like, they got to win a championship at some point. And yeah. then with Tennessee, it's like, well, at some point, you guys got to stop blowing games, right? For sure. Well, Rick Barnes, they don't call him regular season Rick for nothing. <laughs> uh, he has a habit of, of doing this. Hadn't made a Final Four since 2003 with Kevin Durant. You got bounced in the second round. You didn't leave Texas because you weren't making tournaments. You really parted ways with Texas because you weren't advancing in the tournament after multiple chances. And look, 
you know, going into this one, guys, last year, Baylor and Gonzaga were obviously the two best teams. Uh, you knew if they were on opposite sides of the bracket, they were going to run into each other. They ended up doing it. This year, there was really not that elite team. Maybe you could make a case for Arizona uh, throughout the year with the depth. I mean, they got the best player from every continent. It's like a NATO meeting every time they play. <laughs> it but, really is. Um, <laughs> this, the, the parody in this tournament has really kind of mirrored the regular season. I am really disappointed in the SEC, though. You know, I, I thought this year they were one of the most competitive, if not the best conference in college basketball, in there with the Big 12. But – fell flat on their face in the tournament you know we talked about on the show yesterday Arkansas is really kind of having to John Snow this thing from Game of Thrones now uh, for the SEC so it's been wild I mean St. Peter's beats Kentucky you have the AD at Kentucky Mitch Barnhart coming out and saying it's you know this isn't acceptable and it's very disappointing you're paying coach Cal eight million dollars a year to really do less with more than Charmin Ultra <laughs> Well, speaking of that Jon Snow reference then, it's kind of, yeah, it's like that Battle of the Bastards. Everyone's seen that little video or that gif of Jon Snow pulling out the sword right yeah, after his brother gets killed. But Arkansas, how do you think about their chances against Gonzaga? Because Arkansas, too, we got to remember, they really aren't scoring a ton of points, but yeah. they're also finding a way to win games. Well, you know, in, in – March Madness, the teams that can win in multiple ways typically advance the furthest. That's why I look at Texas Tech. One of the reasons I had them in the Final Four is they can win a rock fight. And for you got to win six straight games to win the whole thing. You're not going to shoot, shoot great for every one of those games. So being able to have defense and rebounding, it travels. I think Arkansas is really scrappy. To be honest with you, I haven't been on the Gonzaga train this year. I, I separate the years. I mean, I've gotten a lot of pushback from, you know, Gonzaga fans and, and a lot of, you know, Cinderella. I guess you really can't call Gonzaga Cinderella anymore. But push back on I don't think Gonzaga is what they were last year uh, I thought the way the second half was officiated against Memphis was atrocious I mean Drew, Drew Timmy uh, had more moves than Patrick Swayze with those walking screens they didn't call or the moving screens they didn't call for the whole second half but I think Arkansas can put up a fight they've just got to be even on the rebounds uh, Gonzaga's a lot taller than they are uh, they've got to be able to defend on the perimeter, which Arkansas can really do with Devo and J.D. Note. But on the offensive side, you're going to have to score because eventually Gonzaga is going to get it going offensively. Uh, I think this Jalen Williams, Drew Timmy matchup is going to be really, really interesting. But uh, if I'm Arkansas, you got to win this one ugly. I don't think you can win this one, you know, in the 70s or 80s. I wouldn't say so. Um, now, Jake, what's been your favorite matchup so far of of round one? I think we saw a couple instant classics, but is there a certain game that stuck out mostly to you? Well, you know, it's it's hard not to say St. Peter's and Kentucky, even though I had Kentucky going to the Final Four, just because you know I thought I thought St. Peter's was a part of the Bible. I didn't know they were a school. <laughs> uh, you know, with twenty three hundred people, they're basically on one street, but. Just from a matchup standpoint, I actually really like the Miami-USC matchup. I thought that was going to be really interesting with the way those teams played. You know, neither one has a really dominant inside presence, even though Mobley can play inside out for USC. But typically, you know, styles make fights uh, in March Madness. And, and you see teams that typically advance have guards that are experienced, that can control the ball, that can play in multiple paces. So when I look at matchups, you know, I thought there was a lot, a lot of interesting ones uh, from the first round. You know, you had a bunch of upsets. The Iowa-Richmond game always scared oh, me because me. of the way that Richmond played. Uh, but again, Rich, I kind of fell in the trap of, you know, if you're hot, you're hot. You know, winning the conference tournament, you look at Virginia Tech, they get bounced in round one by Texas after winning the ACC tournament. Iowa gets bounced in won by Richmond after winning the Big Ten tournament, and then Tennessee falls in round two after winning the SEC championship. So I would probably say Miami-USC uh, was probably the most interesting matchup to me just because of the styles they played. Yeah, I mean, I always I always end up making the mistake in March Madness of I love the Jimmys and Joes over the X's and O's, and so I got really hot on, you know, David Roddy. I was a big believer in him. Yeah. Uh, you know, Keegan Murray, uh, Jabari Smith, and I, I, I end up – overlooking the fact like Jabari Smith for example his guards were terrible those guys couldn't couldn't yeah. offic you know couldn't distribute the ball at all couldn't get the you know who's probably going to yeah. be the number one pick involved and, and it, it really torpedoed my bracket yeah well if you see if you watch the way that Auburn had kind of been it's funny I'm from Auburn um you know Jabari Smith's a generational guy watching the way that Auburn played down the stretch as opposed to the way they were playing earlier uh, early in the season they kind of hit a downhill slide because if you watch, I mean, Auburn really doesn't run a lot of stuff. 
I mean, a lot of it is, you know, individual basketball. Mm -hmm. I said all year they have too many heroes and not enough sidekicks. At the end of the day, I don't care if you get it to Jabari and ISO him at the elbow, if you're running him off screens or curls, but you got to do something. You can't just run down there and jack up threes. I mean, we ran more stuff playing at the rec the other night in the (laughs) three-on-three tournament. Well, one of my biggest takeaways is I think Juwan Howard's kind of on this redemption tour. I know that's something you brought up, Brian, and their halftime adjustments have been the best I've seen in the entire yeah. tournament. Juwan Howard coming back after they were down 36-29 at half to Colorado State. I had Colorado State winning. I didn't think Michigan had what it took to win that first matchup. And then they outscored them 46-27. to And then in the Tennessee game, they were down 37-32. And then they outscored Tennessee 44-31. These adjustments have been fantastic. Yeah. Well, you know, they gave a whole new meaning to punching your ticket the way they got in. But uh, (laughs) when I look at Michigan, uh, we, you know, whatever sport it is, whether it's football, whether it's basketball, I mean, even adjusting when you start getting late innings in baseball, that's when you find out who really can coach or not. Everybody has a game plan going in. But if you can't adjust and you can't be malleable to what you're seeing, because if everybody knew what everybody was going to do, anybody could be a coach if you had the right guys around you. So watching guys be able to make the adjustments at halftime, that's when you really find out. Are they doing what we expected? If they are and we're not doing what we expected, do we adjust? If they're doing something different, how do we adjust? Or if it's going well, what little adjustments do we make to not override the way we're playing? I think that's where you see that that long career of playing, understanding the ins and outs of not only offensively but defensively because you got to know one to know the other. And that's what Jawan Howard's great at. I also think he's a really good motivator. Uh, you know, again, mm-hmm. you got to be able to do multiple things as a coach to be able to have success over time. Hunter Dickinson, you know, we say on the show, he's the best Dickinson since Emily, you know, watching <laughs> watching him play and what he's able to do on the inside out, even though he runs like a dinosaur, uh, watching him play inside out is really fun. I think the guards have played a lot better, but again, it's not getting down. Colorado State played out of their mind in that first half. They mm-hmm. shot out of their mind from three, but Michigan never panicked. Uh, you go back to the Michigan, uh, Indiana Big Ten tournament game, you know, Michigan fell apart in the second half. I think they learned a little bit from that, and they've kind of reversed the trend going on from there. But, yeah, I know I was tweeting out. I, Michigan looked like garbage. They, they looked did. like they could not keep up at all. Colorado State was running back and forth. They were they were owning the pace, and it looked like Michigan was just constantly trying to play catch-up. But I think they did a good job, like you said, at the end of that first half. Like, just chip away just a tiny bit so yeah. it's not insurmountable at all. And – Something I want to know, though, Jake, is what's your what's your final four right now? Tell us, Ooh, tell yeah, us what's going to happen. I'm, yeah, I'm breaking this down on the show today. Uh, I'm going to stick with Arizona, uh, even though Houston scares the hell out of me in that game. Uh, I like the depth of Arizona. I like the balance. They can score in spurts. Uh, they can rebound. You know, Kirk Reese going down worried me going in the tournament a little bit. Anytime you, you kind of lose your distributor. Mm-hmm. Uh, it scares you, but I think they've adjust, they've adjusted well. Mothrin is just an absolute animal on the court. I mean, the guy can do everything. He's more clutch than a stick shift. Uh, you know, when I look in the other, I like Miami coming out of the Midwest. I really do. A lot of people are going to take Kansas. Uh, I feel like Kansas is going to kind of fall off a little bit. Creighton was hitting shots early, but them losing their big man during the middle of the year, it just caught up to them. Uh, as that game went on, there's a lot of one and dones on the offensive side when they weren't hitting. Uh, I like Purdue. Uh, Because I like the matchups. Even though St. Peter's, it's been a great story, but so is Hansel and Gretel. Uh, I think the story ends now. Uh, Purdue with Zach Eady and Trevion Williams down low. Guys that do different things. I mean, Eady's straight out of Mordor, man. He's like seven foot four. Doesn't move great, but when you're eight feet tall, you don't have to move great. Uh, I think Trevion Williams is one of the best big man passers in all of basketball. And then Jaden Ivey. I mean, he's a superhero, man. I mean, the, Mm -hmm. the guy can do a little bit of everything. But Stefanovic. You know, the, the the European sniper out there. I mean, the, the guy can really play when he gets hot. He gets really hot. Then you have Morton and some other guys that can do some things. Uh, so I do like Purdue. I'm looking at my bracket. Now I got Texas Tech. I rode with them to go to the Final Four at the beginning. I'm going to ride with them still, uh, just the way I'm operating. And then, uh, you know, looking towards the east, uh, like I said, I like Purdue. I like Texas Tech. I like Arizona. And give me Miami. I, I think those are going to be your Final Four. Oh, yeah. That'll that, win you some money. Yeah. I definitely for me I have Texas Tech, Purdue, Arizona, and I got I got Kansas still winning. But I would yeah. not be surprised if, if Kansas lost. I think especially too Kansas was exposed by TCU. And we talk about someone that looked like they're straight from Mordor, Eddie Lampkin Jr. Oh, that yeah. guy was 
feasting in that game. And that was, I think that was probably the most entertaining game to watch in the tournament, in my opinion. What's been your favorite game? Oh, man, I hate to keep going back to St. Peter's and Kentucky, but I kept thinking they were out the whole time. Michigan, Tennessee was a hell of a game. Uh, yep. I mean, it, it wasn't pretty at times, uh, but everybody was running stuff. Tennessee didn't hit a lot of shots. I thought Vescovy, you know, uh, kind of disappeared and put him on the back of a milk carton for that game in, in the second half going forward. So I thought the Tennessee-Michigan game, but it's hard not to say Arizona and TCU wasn't, wasn't the best game. TCU mm -hmm. punched way above their weight. Oh, I think yeah. what Jamie Dixon did down the stretch and – uh, was very impressive. But Kansas, man, I just don't trust them. I just don't trust them. I watch what Kentucky did to them in Fog Allen. I, I just, if Braun's not operating, if Abaji's not hitting, they're a totally different team. I mean, McCormick's been hit or miss down low. Christian Braun's a, a guy that's very, very talented, especially taking the ball to the basket. He can shoot the three as well. Uh, but, you know, I don't trust Kansas, even though, look, with this smart, with the way college basketball is right now, who the hell really knows? We could end up having St. <laughs> Peter's, uh, Arkansas, uh, Michigan, and you know Iowa State in the Final Four at this point. Who knows? You have to tell Jake. Oh, I gotta if you tell put you that. One, if you put one dollar down on this, Jake, yeah, the return. The Final Four. You literally just said if you were to go to to DraftKings, a one dollar bet on Iowa State, St. Peter's, Michigan, and Arkansas making the Final Four would pay out twenty thousand uh, dollars. A one dollar bet. One dollar. All right, it's, I'll it's, you guys. It's a lottery ticket. It. <laughs> I'm going. I'm going right now. Yeah. <laughs> That's but Jake, hilarious. Jake, as we as we wrap up here, obviously, like March Madness is the best time of the year. This is my Christmas. For sure. This is this is so fun. And then for everybody watching and listening right now, obviously, part of that Sweet 16 is going to start tomorrow. I'm going to be in front of the TV all day long. But tell us about how Crane & Co. is going at, at Daily Wire and how the response has been from your audience and how the response has been from – you know, even the God King, who's now coming out with his own uh, razor company. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, Cone and Blaine, the co-hosts on the show, were actually in that commercial arguing in the Hannibal Lecter room as he's walking in about to high five Michael Knowles. So you can actually see <laughs> I gotta rewatch. their acting debut. So <laughs> they'll be at the Oscars, I'm sure, at, at some point in time. But man, it's been unbelievable. I mean, we hit number one in the world on Apple Podcasts for sports and number two on Spotify a couple weeks ago. Uh, the, the audience reaction's been fantastic. I mean, you know, the... It, it's, it's a simple game plan. I mean, we just talk sports. I mean, and we don't try and force stuff down your throat. I mean, ESPN has a tweet yesterday that was just absolutely ridiculous that I'm sure you saw on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, producers, you know, it, if we have that back there, we can maybe throw that up on the screen. Oh I'd, love, I'd love to get your take on, on that. Well, it's like my thing is like if I want to hear that, then then if I want to hear about that, then I'll watch channels that talk about it. Like, why can't we talk about Zion maybe coming back, or why can't we talk about this great March Madness? If people want to, it's like if I want to tune into a gardening show, I'm not gonna go to the cooking channel. Like, I don't. I, it just you know, it just surprises me sometimes. And and again, it's not that you can't have opinions, but when you try and force it down people's throat like that, it just doesn't work. Yeah, I mean. Like, guys, like, can we just – can we get in a huddle and talk about it? Like, pun intended yeah, cause, for sports? Because we mean, have that on the – it's just a whole thing going down the list. I mean, it's just – it's it's great because it drives traffic this way. But the, the audience has been fantastic, man, and, and the Daily Wire has been, been awesome. Shapiro and all the guys love the show. Um, you know, getting able to meet them and everybody that works here, it's a big team effort. So, I mean, the studio, like y'all's, is awesome. Ours is awesome, too. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, man, we're live uh, 2 to 3 Central every weekday. Uh, got a big announcement for uh, maybe a little Final Four thing coming up. I don't want to hey. you know, put out the bag a little too early on that. So uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So, yeah, we're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, DailyWire.com, all that stuff. And it's been uh, it's been amazing, man. I love it. And then I know for people watching right now, we have that ESPN tweet up here. It says, ESPN believes in inclusivity and denounces legislation and action across the United States that infringe on any human rights. We stand with our LGBTQIA+, the alphabet and math symbol people, and our colleagues, friends, families, and fans. And then they had a full thread, ladies and gentlemen, about all these stories about everybody that's a part of this community, a part of this group. And it's so true when Clay Travis says this is MSESPN. 100%. They yeah, are a left-wing propagandist political network that happens to talk about sports. And then I know I put in that thread i was like you got anything to say about biological males taking opportunities and erasing women from the record book or are you guys just gonna totally ignore how women's sports is under attack right now of course yeah. they have no answer to that no and and they won't answer it because again it's it's groupthink 
Uh, mm-hmm. if you're, you're either in the group or you're not in the group and anything that challenges anything, uh, is erroneous and you're a terrible person and nobody should ever talk to you. It's, it's, it's a joke. I mean, I, I don't, it, I, you know what, you know, what's sad. I remember growing up watching sports center replays three times in a row with guys like Stuart Scott and Kenny May Booyah. and Patrick. That was, you talk about the good Linda Cohn. Yep. I mean, I can go down the list. Uh, look, it, it's all cyclical. It's going to come back and bite them because once you dig yourself in that hole, you can't dig yourself out of it. So eventually, you know, it's like I talk about teams, time over talent equals results. We're going to see. Final take I want from you here is I know they even made a stance on live television about this. They didn't just tweet. I know uh, Ellie Duncan, she said she was joining her colleagues and speaking up while being silent about – Obviously, there's the they're calling it the don't say gay bill in Florida. And she said, I'm just going to be silent. And then it's so funny when it ended up changing to the halftime score, of that women's March Madness game. And it was South Carolina, 44, Howard, four. <laughs> like this is like you you think you're watching SNL right now. It's. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Well, it's the it's the blind leading the blind. I mean, it's the best way I can put it. It's the blind leading the blind. And you know what? My thing is, Dawn Staley. Eventually, she may end up getting a men's job, head coach at men's job. I mean, she can coach. That, that's not taking anything away from mm-hmm. South Carolina. But I remember watching Gino Rem and UConn beating people 120 to 17 a couple years ago, and that's always pushed back. I've never understood revenue. Sh- ratings and revenue should drive what's on that that's that i don't that's why i don't get the argument against it like if if you want to make an excuse why people aren't watching things that's one thing that's your belief but at the end of the day little wayne said it best women lie men lie and numbers don't lie (laughs) amen but jake thank you so much for joining us everybody crane and co make sure you go check them out support them and then where can they follow you on instagram as well uh, you can follow us. It's uh, at Crane and Company uh, and at Jake Crane underscore J K E C R A I N. Uh, David Cohn and Blaine, uh, my co host, they're on there as well on Twitter. It's Jake Crane underscore. It's at Crane Company. Go follow us. It's uh, It's been a lot of fun and it's uh, it's been a nice little glow up. And uh, y'all do a great job, man. Anytime, John, I need to get you guys on as well. Yeah, I appreciate that. This guy's got the best analogies in the business. Jake, thank you. I appreciate it, man. I'm trying to be the next Dr. Seuss, but not a weird, <laughs> weird Don't get canceled. That's exactly <laughs> See you. right. See, See you, Jake. Man, what a mic drop! Dropping a little Wayne lyrics on us, just uh, just on you know on his way out that door. No, Jake, it's funny because I uh, like he mentioned I had him on IG Live, but mm-hmm. we wanted to get him on the show. We had a few little things that were changing up here in the studio while Charlie Kirk was moving to his brand new studio just a couple buildings down, and he has just such an unbelievable mind. Oh yeah, it's like some of his analogies and some of his one-liners are just incredible i feel like it's like in you know would, would jake you hear that kind of that little bit of the southern drawl in there as well i'm like man dude it's, it's people from the south dude they can they can make a metaphor or simile out of anything <laughs> no doubt uh, but for everybody tuning in we appreciate you guys uh very much while you're tuning in you can always follow us on instagram at tpusa breakaway we just went over 3100 followers we're going to the moon baby diamond hands Let's baby go. appreciate you guys and, and while you're watching right now obviously you can always subscribe to the podcast we're on apple and spotify we're obviously on youtube right now we want to make sure we can make this even a little bit more interactive we might start getting to comments here and there and start yeah probably start a mailbag pretty soon of of you know people can write in questions and and we'll take a section out and and you know address what questions people have yeah and some questions that people have i think we can jump into the nfl for a hot second before we bring in dennis arfate who played in the nippon i hope i'm saying that right he's he's gonna tell me but it was the japanese baseball league it's the top baseball league out there and he was a pitcher and he went against shohei otani i know we had him on the show when we very first launched we just had those half an hour shows mm-hmm. on on tpusa live and tpusa live is something you obviously got to check out to tpusa.com slash live um but he's going to give us a breakdown of what he thinks about the otani rule and baseball being back but big news right when we jumped into the studio here before the show started tyreek hill big splash in free agency pun intended going to miami he is a dolphin and he's now the highest paid wide receiver in the national football league 
four-year, $120 million contract. I mean, what a way to wake up this morning. I get up, and, and within the first little bit of me being up, I get the you know the uh, notification from, I think, Schefter. No, it was Ian Rappaport. Over $72 million guaranteed. Dude, it's crazy. But this is what confuses me a little bit. I, basically, what ended up happening was the Kansas City Chiefs have been working on a contract extension with Tyreek Hill, and I think the Devontae Adams new deal completely messed it up, stalled everything to where... Tyreek said, I want more money than that. And they went, mm, well, we're not going to give that to you. And also, they're probably thinking, we can't give that to you because we're start, we're about to start paying. This is the last year of, of uh, well, I think we just went through the last year of Patrick Mahomes' rookie deal. Now it's moving into the contract extension, the $45 million a year. So the Chiefs are about to get really expensive. And Tyreek, you know, the $30 million a year to a, to a wide receiver, 45 to a quarterback. That gets that gets pricey. What's weird to me, John, though, is the AFC West all off season has been loading up with talent. I mean, they AFC West has brought in uh, obviously Russell Wilson, Randy Gregory, Devontae Adams, Chandler Jones, uh, J.C. Jackson, Khalil Mack. I mean, these are superstars at the position. And what have the Chiefs brought in? Juju Smith Schuster to make some TikToks. Well, I know Jackson Mahomes actually gave him a little shout out too. Like, wow, we have a dynamic duo on TikTok, oh, and this is gosh. about to be. Watch out for anybody that has their number retired or some sort of memorial service. Yeah. Uh, they might be dancing on your number. They'll be dancing on your logo. Woof! Watch out. I just, I I I don't understand how you can honestly like are the Chiefs now they got an absolute haul back for for Tyreek Hill five drop picks in total, a first, a second, a fourth of this year from Miami, and then like a fourth and a fifth or a fourth and a sixth from yeah, for I'll, next year. Yeah, I'll look year. that up real quick from uh, Adam Schefter to find out exactly what what that haul was. But it was a massive haul that they that they just got. Mm -hmm. and it, well, and it was big because who they're bidding against was the uh, – they were bidding against the, the Jets. And remember, the Jets have pick number four and ten. I imagine the Jets were offering up that number 10 pick, and then the Jets also have picks number 35 and 38, meaning they just had a lot more, a lot more ammo. Uh, so, and and also Tyreek, this Matt Miller on Twitter pointed this out in the offseason, He lives in Miami, so I'm sure he was like, "No, I want to go to Miami," and so Miami going like, "Hey, we want to bring this guy in." They over, they had to outbid the Jets, and so they gave up, they gave up a lot to get him. But Tyreek's dynamic, dude. He's, he's probably the fastest wide receiver in football. No I mean, doubt. No doubt. But those picks that they got is 2022 first-round pick, the number 29 pick, second-round pick, the 50th pick in this next year's draft, or this year's draft, excuse me, fourth-round pick as well as a fourth and sixth-round pick in the 2023 draft. It's a lot of value. They got P-I-C-K-S picks, picks, <laughs> picks. Sorry, I, Jets. I have to imagine. So now the Chiefs have two first-round picks. One of them's going to be a wide receiver. I mean, they, they have to because you can't roll into next year with with Juju. Oh, well, I mean, you still got Travis Kelsey. Um, maybe they bring in a veteran. Will Fuller, I know, is still available. Jarvis Landry is still available. There's st I mean, there's still some talent out there. Julio Jones is available. Mm -hmm. And Because no. I know it's funny because on March 18th, I know we're going to try to throw that up on the screen right now too, but McCall Hardman. He was just like, all right, well, pro football focus. You guys are tweeting out about, like, what the projected Chiefs offense is looking like. Uh, okay, I get it. I'll be I'll be left off. But he's <laughs> now going to be inserted in that. And I know I just sent that back to the production team. I got that in the chat. We can maybe throw that up on, on the screen. They were showing Patrick Mahomes. They had Clyde Edwards-Hilaire. Uh, Tyree Kill was obviously in there. Sh uh, Juju Smith-Schuster in, in Travis Kelsey. And then he's he literally quote tweets it and says, Man, it's okay. I understand. And for everybody watching that's <laughs> that's, that's a on great the, way to respond. That's on the, the screen right there. And it's gonna you're gonna really see what he he's all about. There's a lot of receivers out there that are gonna be able to get their chance to be superstars like they want. They're gonna get a little bit more balls, they're gonna get a little bit more targets. Um but getting a little bit more ball, we're getting a little bit more baseball. Hey. So we're gonna bring in our boy Dennis here. I know he's been on the breakaway uh, show before, then we kind of moved to podcast format. Dennis, one of the best beards, I think, in Arizona. How you doing? Is that pretty good? I mean, oh, incredible. <laughs> I had to get a beard straightener because it was getting crazy. So my wife lets me keep it only if I keep it cleaned up. 
<laughs> but tell us, Dennis, a little bit more about your background playing uh, Japanese professional baseball and going against Shohei Otani. For some of our listeners and viewers uh, that might not know your story. Yeah, sure. So I played 10 years here in the States, Milwaukee, Houston, Baltimore, went overseas to Japan in 2011 and uh, got to see Shohei early on as a youngster. There was a lot of hype around him possibly foregoing, going to the MPB and coming straight to the big leagues uh, or to the, over here to the States. And um, he chose to stay with the fighters, which you Darvish was for that team. And mm-hmm. they do a really good job of uh, grooming those players and getting them ready for the States. And so I got to see him just progressed over the years. You know, I was on Baseball America right when he got posted and I said, if he doesn't figure out the fastball in, he's gonna Mm -hmm. struggle. And early in that spring training, you saw guys blowing him up inside and all of a sudden he made a switch and he made the adjustment. And now you see the two-way star that he is. We always knew he had a good arm. He could always pitch. We handled him a few times. He got the best of us a few times, but his bat was what was always the most impressive to me. And then you saw what he can do last year from both sides. It's just, it's, it's insane. Tell our audience what you told your teammates about throwing them inside when you're out there playing in Japan, because they were terrified to throw inside against Shohei. Yeah. He's, he's a God there. He's an icon just like, you know, Ichiro was, but they were so scared because he's a left-handed hitter, right-handed pitcher, his right arms exposed. So all these guys would be like, we're not pitching him in. And he would go up there first pitch. No, it's going to be something middle away and just, helped it and finally i had enough of watching this happen he'd lead off the game with a home run all the time against us and i'm just like guys i will pay you a thousand dollars if you throw in and hit him and no one ever did it no one ever took me up on my offer so (laughs) just usually they don't care about me or money they just they wanted to respect the guy and then what do you think about the Otani rule now? Because obviously the lockout is over. I think this is great, especially like we, we both live out here in, in Arizona, and I love spring training. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to be going to some spring training games, my first ones this weekend. But they made a, a, a few little adjustments. I know they're still going to have the ghost runner just this year only in extra innings on second base. I think that's an absolute joke. I think it it's a scam. A it makes it tough for pitchers. But I want to know what you think about ghost runner. And then now the Shohei Otani rule, which is what they're what they're coining it right now, is that pitchers can remain in the game as a DH even after they get pulled as a pitcher. Sure. So first, ghost runner, I think that's something that we played in the cul-de-sac with a wiffle ball back in the day. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think it has any way – uh, needs to make its way into the big leagues. I think that extra inning games, yes, are they tiring the bullpens and does it hurt? But you know what? It gets young guys up from the minor leagues. The next day, uh, fans seem to stick it out. The Otani rule, I think, has been a long time coming. I honestly, a pitcher's not going to stay in the game an extra inning just because he can hit because the guy on the bench is always a better hitter than the pitcher. Mm-hmm. I mean, guys like Madison Bumgarner and, and those guys, yeah, they can hit. But if you have someone on the bench that is an everyday player that literally swings the bat 100 times, 200 times a day, you want him up Mm -hmm. at the plate. On a DH lineup, the pitcher's irrelevant. And I can say that because I was a pitcher, but literally it's the nine batters and the pitcher's on a little line outside of the lineup. So you don't even care about the pitcher at that point. You care about the lineup. And I think that the DH brings that into the game where you can, if your pitcher can hit and you like Otani, let him be the DH. And if he comes out of the game, who cares who's pitching next? He should still be able to hit. So I think the rule change for that is awesome. I think it's something that should have been done. And uh, I'm glad to see them make that change over. Give people the understanding of what it's like to be a pitcher when they're trying to implement like pitch clocks and things like that. Does that something that just really messes up your timing or every, even your communication with the catcher because I think what Major League Baseball is they're trying to make mountains out of molehills and what you're trying to just save a couple minutes off the top of a game but I feel like you go to a baseball game or you watch a baseball game and you know you're going to be there for like three hours mm-hmm. it shouldn't sure. be shocking to anybody yeah uh it brings me back back in the day in high school when I was watching the D-backs when they first became an expansion team they had a guy named Armando Reynoso <laughs> it was a human rain delay right he would it would be a minute and a half between each pitch and you're like this is ridiculous so i understand what they're trying to do for me pitching fast actually helps the pitcher if you give the hitter more than 12 seconds they they have this little thing of 12 seconds if you can throw a pitch get back on the mound and be ready to throw another one before 12 seconds that hitter doesn't have that chance to regroup he might have had a bad swing 
you give him another minute. Now he can think, he can take a few practice hacks, but if you're in there just spit firing balls, guys like Maddox, Ben Sheets used to be really good at that. Ben Sheets, mm -hmm. when I was with the Brewers, he used to average like nine seconds Jeez. in between each pitch. And it just keeps the fielders on their toes, but I don't think you can force it. I don't think some guys might not work that way. You know, a guy in the, in the, in the a reliever comes in in a tight game to win, you know, go to the playoffs or even in the playoffs. And now he has to speed up his game to make it into this guideline. I don't think that's right. Starting pitchers. If you want to do it for a starter, yeah, speed up the first five innings. These guys are out there long enough. They can, you know, speed it up a little bit, but I think putting a pitch clock, it's not basketball. We can't be having, what are you going to have a siren go off and <laughs> the guy's awarded a ball or you get the, you have, he gets a free pass. Like, what is it? I, yeah. Too many rules in this game coming up. Yeah, there'd be a baseball free throw. What do they just put it oh, on the tee? What do they do? <laughs> just yeah. like hit it wherever, okay. hit it wherever you want. But Dennis, over the last few years, we've kind of seen uh, the ratings, TV ratings, start to drop a little bit for baseball. A lot of people are kind of worried about the future of baseball, even though the money continues to go up. Um, what do you think about the future of baseball, and what what would you do? Or do you have any thoughts on how to get more young people involved and excited about baseball? Yeah. Uh, first of all. I used to watch baseball every day because I had to, right? I'd be in, waiting to go in the ninth inning, and I had to watch every inning. It is brutal. Like, no one wants to sit there and watch an entire <laughs> game. Lower the prices to go to a stadium. Let fans come to the game for it cheaper. I mean, I don't even know how families of four or five afford to go to a sporting event anymore. Oh, yeah. Besides the ticket prices alone, the drinks, um, it's, it's absurd. So lower the prices a little bit for that. You're, they're getting a killing off the TV deals, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I saw a stat before the, uh, the lockout ended. Owners get $100 million before even anything happens on the field from the, the local TV rights and then the MLB rights when they sell it to YouTube, Apple, $100 million. So a team wow. like the Marlins, who literally has 3,500 to 5,000 fans at a game, is already in the black for the entire year because their payroll is 60. So they're up 40 million on, and on the get-go. Then they get the luxury tax money that's flying in. So you have to make it a way to make it more affordable to come to a game, bring the fans back into the stadium. That's how this all started, right? Even before TVs, fans mm -hmm. had day games. They would go out, they would, you know, Ferris Bueller's day off. They would skip school and go to a Cubs game for a day game, like make more day games, make it more affordable. I don't think you can keep changing these rules to make, because then you're starting to lose our national pastime, which is baseball, and what this game started as early on in the 1900s in this country, and you're ruining you're ruining it with all these rules. You really are. And I want to get your take on this because Jock Peterson tweeted out, uh, I think that was just yesterday, and he was saying uh, that he's embarrassed for your fan base. Be better if you can't sell your team to somebody that wants to show the fan base in baseball that they're at least trying to compete sorry this is unacceptable and then he quote tweeted and had a photo of the 2022 payroll and i know that's something i just sent to the producers back there so if we could throw that up on the screen for for our viewers he was showing the top three in baseball and it's and it's just not shocking to us to find out you know the dodgers and the yankees are up there and obviously the mets they have one of the best starting rotations I think I've seen in a very long time. They just took uh, my boy Chris Bassett from Oakland, who I think is going to find a lot of success over there. And then the bottom three, so the top three, look at this. Everybody's watching, and for people listening, I'll, I'll let you know what these numbers are. Dodgers, over $270 million in total payroll. And then the Yankees around uh, $235 million. The bottom three, Guardians, which is silly to have to say, $35 million. Um, and then we got Pirates that's just around $35 million as well, and then the Orioles are at $30 million. I mean, it sounds like exactly what you're saying, Dennis, is they ha they have to be better, and how are these teams sup supposed to compete? Sure, that was what the whole lockout was about. I talked to plenty of guys that are still playing that just signed after the lockout ended, big league deals. But you're talking about the, the money that the owners pull in, and – to, to be able, like the Orioles getting the uh, Masson deal, plus the, the, tele, the, the tele, television rights with MLB, $30, $30 million for your team payroll is embarrassing. Yeah. Like that city is one of the best baseball cities around. I love my time there. I played there three years. The stadium's amazing. Like 
we were in first place until August in 2008. And then the talent caught up, right? We had to face the Yankees and the Red Sox every other week. It felt like, and they just had the money in these players. You know, when, when your eight hole hitters, Robinson Cano and your seven hole hitters, Jason Giambi, that's a tough lineup. You know, I remember starting a game once in Yankee stadium and I remember I got to the nine hole and it was the catcher. And I was like, thank goodness for a free out <laughs> because it's like, man, you can't get a break, but to have a $30 million payroll in the big leagues, it's tanking. And that's what this whole fight was about. The players were saying no more, you can't tank it. That's why the playoff roster expansion is such a big battleground is because if you let in 14 teams now, well, that's two extra teams that they don't have to do as well. They can kind of sneak in there at the end with a 40, $50 million payroll. And then for the team to get to the playoff, that's a win for the owner. And that shouldn't be right. You should bring out the best that you can, you can do to help your city win and your team be the best field team competitively wise. Well, and then we're hearing reports that there was a 36% increase in the money spent in free agency. They've been going boco loco. And that's why I feel like it's such a bummer that we didn't have the winter meetings and all this free agency stuff going down because they were in a lockout. It's out of sight, out of mind. You're talking about mm -hmm. trying to grow the game. No one's talking about baseball other than well, they haven't come together in an agreement. They, it was almost 100 days. They, yeah. uh, it was a 99-day lockout. But get this. This is how much money they have spent on major league contracts. $3.265 billion. It's crazy. Yeah. Since the lockout ended. That is, that is bonkers. Yeah, I thought it was going to be like Barrett Jackson where they just have a guy come up <laughs> on stage, start bidding, and then boom, sold, then just go to the next. Because how do you – there's still guys unsigned right now still trying to negotiate, and it's mm -hmm. just like this should have been a forefront. This should have been out in the news, guys getting these mega deals. Because what happens is now the, the fans can be like, wait a second, if these owners are complaining about the money, but they're shelling out hundreds of million dollars, well, someone's got to be making the money to be shelling out that kind of money. These guys aren't idiots. They're billionaires. They're, they're not stupid with money. And so, you know, the thing with the Orioles, there was things back in the day where they would bring in a free agent. They would offer him 150,000 or $150 million. He'd have a physical and they'd be like, uh, yeah, we don't like that physical. And they would take the contract away. And it was just like to show the fans, Oh, we're trying, but this guy's hurt or we're trying. They did it so many times. And finally guys just stopped trying to sign with them. To share a past on, he signed with the Yankees. He signed for 150 million, and I believe the Orioles offered him a little bit more. And he and that was his hometown team. And he ended up going to New York instead. Obviously, guys want to win. Guys want to finish their career on a winning team. I know. Oh, just make your money and go play wherever. It sucks to lose every day and be an embarrassment on the field and make money. Yeah, that's great, but it sucks. And then final question for you, Dennis, before we let you go, is. Uh, so when I said 36% increase, that was a 36% increase from 2016, which was $2.4 billion spent on free agency. Um, wow. What do you think can be done about this? Like some sort of salary cap? Uh, like people just want to know the solution to this money issue because they want to see their team win, but they also don't want to spend tons of money, like you said, to go watch them at the stadium. Sure. I mean, I guess I can say it now that I'm retired. A salary cap, is it a good idea? I mean, guys are making $45 million to play the game. Obviously, they're bringing in a certain level of talent for the owner to make money off of their, their talents. But um, that probably is the only way to truly fix it. So that's an even playing ground. If that was what the owners were trying to do from the get-go, then, then good for them. I don't think that was their, their end game in this lockout. I, I honestly think that they're just tired of paying players and they're tired of, of increases and all that with inflation going up and gas prices. I mean, I might come out of retirement. So, uh, <laughs> You're going to pull a Tom Brady. Day. Yeah. I'll pull a Tom Brady. Um, but yeah, I think there has to be some kind of level where you can get everyone in. The, if a team is making a hundred million dollars from TV rights and you only spend 35, you should have to spend every single dollar of that money. Mm -hmm. Your profit should come off what comes out of the team and what bills the team. Yeah. If you're winning, no wonder the Yankees make a ton of money. They ain't complaining about spending $235 million a year because they're probably made they're What are they worth? Four or five billion dollars as a team, as an organization. Yeah. So I think there has to be a level playing field. But if you're giving these teams like the Marlins in 2008 were the team, the number one team in the black as total profit for an entire season. 
they had the smallest fan base and the lowest attendance in games. But the reason why they finished in the black was because of the free money they got from the luxury tax, from TV deals and local TV rights. And that to me is a shame that people are spending money to watch the team. And then they're, what, what are they watching? They're watching a triple a team in the mm -hmm. big league instead of bringing up, and there's nothing wrong with having a young team and being good. I mean, I feel like the Braves, you know, brought up a lot of young talent and, and were really well. A lot of teams have done it, but like my team in Japan, the SoftBank Hawks, my owner spent money because he wanted to win. And he knew if he won, more fans would come and we would sell out 50,000 fans almost every game. And yeah, and like, you you're, like you're saying, the Yankees are worth $5.25 billion. And I hope people like John Fisher, the owner of the A's, are listening to things like this because sure. it's – I know – the A's are near and dear to heart. I grew up in the Bay Area and just felt like the A's were constantly just the feeder team for the Yankees and these other yeah. big squads. And it was just like, just like you said, it's a triple A team. And they were still like finding so much success. Moneyball is my, one of my favorite movies, one of my favorite books, but it's just like, I want to win. I don't want to be like, Oh, well we did a lot with a little way to go. And the new, <laughs> and the new stadium isn't going to make you a winning team, right? Not Everyone exactly like the diamondbacks are fighting for new stadium. It's like, I remember when the stadium was built 20 something years ago, like what's wrong with it? Like that's not going to bring the fans and, and the fans in, uh, interaction, put a winning team on there. And I guarantee it, you'll see the stadiums filled up. And if it was more even, then I think you would have an opportunity to see more teams make it to the playoffs uh, on a consistent basis. Like the pirates, what, what a great town to play in. Pittsburgh's one of my favorite, the stadium there's amazing, but they just continue to, let free agents walk and then they sign guys who are on their way out and it's just it's not fa fair to the fans whereas literally right down the river the pittsburgh steelers can compete with anybody and you know they have a great fan base they pro sell a ton of merch and free agents love to come play for pittsburgh because yeah. it's a culture thing exactly like ownership matters so it, it is just sad to see you know bad ownership create bad organizations yeah i couldn't name one guy in the orioles this year and i played you know for this team and I, I couldn't name one player on that team that that's still relevant in the game. Oh, maybe Mancini, just because I, mm -hmm. I know his story and, and what he went through. But that's it. I mean, that's that's pretty that's pretty sad. It's a bummer. Yeah, pretty rough when you pay Chris Davis that amount of money just to strike out uh, <laughs> nine times out of ten. But, but Dennis, definitely appreciate you. We got to have you back on soon because uh, I need. Absolutely. I think we need to have this kind of take when we hear something about the Otani rule and what's going on. Uh, with this money stuff because we weren't we weren't pitchers in major league baseball dennis so we appreciate yeah. you well hey I, i'm just glad that you guys know what a woman is so <laughs> God bless you guys. don't assume our gender see you dennis all right later brother <laughs> oh, my man. goodness also dennis too um just like i mentioned before he's been on uh, the show before when we first launched breakaway for people that might be new to the podcast new to the breakaway brand uh, we had like a half an hour show on TV USA Live. Mm -hmm. So we had some amazing people like David Akers, legendary kicker from the Philadelphia Eagles. We had Tito Ortiz on. Uh, and then Dennis was, you know, a part of that lineup that was incredible. And him giving us a breakdown of what it was like to play in Japan and just some of the um, antics that their fan base used to do was oh the so, balloons and stuff the, the snake bal balloons <laughs> you brought it up you have to look this up like they do these like snake balloons um but it just he said it just looks like sperm all, all over the place like they it let them does. go like, it, it, it is it's weird it's weird but also dennis does a great job standing up um for abortion rights mm -hmm. uh when it's like anti-abortion rights to make sure people know uh, they have the tools and resources for that. Like, it's not an easy thing to talk about, just like it's not easy to talk about, you know, this trans issue. Like, there's a lot of people that are call you a transphobe or in the abortion topic w with Dennis. I think we had a good conversation with him about, like, hey, now that you're outside of sports, you know, what would you, what do you wish people would stand up for a little bit instead of just, like, this virtue signaling with, like, social justice or even what ESPN's been doing? Like you bring up anything about abortion, like all of a sudden it's just like, you don't have a uterus, you don't have an opinion. It's like, mm -hmm. well, does the kid have an opinion? But he does a great job making sure that uh, he works on legislation and that people once again have the tools and resources uh, to know exactly what it means to be pushing abortion in this country and how it's basically a genocide. Yeah, no, Dennis does, does a great job with that. Um, one thing we, we didn't jump into with, with Dennis, but MLB, I kind of wanted to, 
kind of wanted to get your take on. What in the world are the Rockies doing? I mean, 13 months yeah. ago, they traded away Nolan Arenado, who is arguably, you know, best top three, you know, third baseman in, you know, in the league. Yeah, like he might even be like the best because you have someone like Matt Chapman, who I yeah. think might be a better defensive third baseman, mm-hmm. um, just just barely, uh, who just got traded to the Blue Jays. But Nolan Arenado, he's he's been solid, and he's someone that a fan base really enjoys. Like, oh, he was the face of their franchise. Yeah, and what this is what confuses me so much from an ownership side. They ate fifty one million dollars of that contract. They continued to pay it, and then this offseason, mm-hmm. just a few days ago, they signed Chris Bryant to a massive contract. I I I don't understand. You know, I'm a, I'm a D-backs fan, so I, I see a lot of Rockies games uh, throughout the year. I mean, last year. They were one of the only teams that made me feel good about the Diamondbacks because the Diamondbacks were such a freaking joke. But it was it was nice to know the Rockies were just as bad. Um, I, I I don't understand. This seems like such a lateral move to make of going from Arenado to Chris Bryant. Well, Chris Bryant kind of had like a little bit of a resurgence with uh, the San Francisco Giants. They had a they had another great year. Mm-hmm. I can't stand the Giants if I just bring out the fandom in me. But I will always give credit where credits due. Like, they were able – like, a team that was able to take just a bunch of ragtag guys and win world championships was was fantastic. But last year he hit 262 with the Giants, um, and he had – you know, he only had, like, seven home runs. But he was able to, you know, really contribute to a team that was – Competitive. Yeah, was one of the best teams in baseball at one point. Mm -hmm. And, like, it – piss me off <laughs> as an but also manager. too i think it's one of those where the rockies they've been needing starting pitching for so long and i liked uh, like, gray who was there a few years ago but like they just could never like he he was probably a number three maybe a number two in your rotation yeah. they needed an ace is what they needed yeah but. well they've never had it and that's why i feel like you got to be so frustrated as a rockies fan because yeah sure you're gonna bring in chris bryant like it's no Arenado, but are they trying to play the long game a little bit? Uh, and where they just kind of feel like, all right, the Dodgers are just kind of the team right now, and we'll like stick with Charlie Blackman. Hopefully, he just has a, another okay season with us, and then uh, we'll figure out what we're going to do in this division. But yeah, you're also really not going to do too much with CJ Cron at first base. Uh, he was pretty garbage with the uh, with the Angels, and I don't know if he's going to really do too much for you there. But I am glad that baseball is back uh, in, in general. It is amazing. Baseball is a very fun sport. I geek out on the analytics and the matchups in, in baseball. I know another thing that they were trying to eliminate is the shift. Mm-hmm. And basically for people that for some reason you don't know what the shift is, um, you're basically going to take your third baseman, push him to the shortstop position, and then you're going to move your shortstop into shallow right field when you have a left-handed batter up or vice versa when you have a right-handed batter up because most likely they're not going to be hitting opposite field. Yeah. Um, obviously, I think you see that with left-handed batters a little bit more because people want to see home runs. Mm-hmm. They, wanna, they don't want to see pitching duels. For me, I can really enjoy a pitching duel. I can geek out on that for sure. Yeah. But – with something like that, Mad Max, I know you were talking about that. He is making some money. Well, it's just hilarious the juxtaposition of you showed what the Orioles spent on their entire team last season, which was $30 million, and Mad Max is— their is, payroll this season. I oh, think. that's their payroll this season right now? Holy crap. Yeah, 2022 total payroll. That's oh what Jock gosh. Peterson shared, yeah. So, yeah. So, <laughs> Orioles are spending $30 million on their team. Mad Max is making 43 He's making more than their entire roster combined. That is like— like you know, like Dennis said, the Orioles at this point are a triple A team. They just they're, they're a fairly well paid triple A team. Yeah, that's what they are because they are not playing in the same league as as a guy like Max Scherzer. Which yeah, like once again you say <laughs> what the a Mets crazy are, guy are spending to build just a crazy rotation. Dude, him and uh, Liam Hendricks are the craziest pitchers in Major League Baseball. Liam Hendricks, I got to know him when he was playing for the A's. I know he came to a couple Sharks games when I was working for them. And both those guys are so dang intense on the mound. Like th- those guys, those guys are nuts. But just look at those crazy eyes, dude. Dude, he is. He's he's a wild. He's a wild man. I would not want to be in the the batter's box. But but think about this uh, as we wrap up Major League Baseball, the projected rotation for the New York Mets: Jacob 
DeGrom. Keller. Jake the Rake. That guy, you talk about someone that can bat as well. Jake is solid in the batter's box, not just on the mound. Mad Max Scherzer. Chris Bassett, best pitcher for the A's, probably over the past two, three seasons, most consistent. Just got moved over to uh, the Mets. Uh, Tajon Walker. Uh, t- t- hey, I th- it's pronounced Taiwan Walker. Taiwan, yeah. So yeah. he actually had a stint with the uh, uh, with the D-backs. We got him from Seattle. And what I could say is he, he ended up getting injured while he was here with us. Um, I don't think it was Tommy Johns, but uh, – I was actually really bummed because he he throws with some decent power. I really liked him on the mound. So the fact that he's your five, dude, that is a good rotation. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very good rotation. There's some of those guys there. My God, that is terrifying. And last one they have is right-handed pitcher Carlos Carrasco. Holy crap. Carrasco's great. Mets are going to be nice. Um, But also, too, if you're unvaccinated and you're a New York Met or a New York Yankee, you ain't playing, baby. It's the same thing uh, like Kyrie Irving. Absolute insanity out in New York City. I know Eric Adams has doubled down on all that. He's like, sure, Kyrie can play or any of these guys can play, but uh, you know how you do that? Get vaccinated. Get the jab. That's it. That's that's the only way you live your life. And it's, it's, crazy. it's crazy to me because they're going to be able to attend games just like Kyrie Irving can, but for some reason they can attend that game without a vax, without a mask but they can't play do you guys see what's happening here i feel like i'm taking crazy pills literally you see what's happening here they said you can kind of be a part of society but i don't want you to make money and i don't want you to feel like there is any other option outside of the jab because you know why i'm making some money thank you mayor eric adams really appreciate your scientific take on this on this whole thing so hopefully none of that starting rotation is unvaxxed because you ain't playing at home um but something that um we are starting brand new here on the Ooh. breakaway podcast <laughs> get ready we always have some spicy hot takes but i think we're taking it to the next level we're bringing the heat up a notch ladies and gentlemen for the very first time we have kirk's hot sauce spicy hot take I love that it's sponsored oh, yeah. by, by, if you don't know, uh, Kirk's Hot Sauce, Charlie Kirk, founder and CEO of our organization, Turning Point USA, he has launched his own hot sauce brand, Kirk's Hot Sauce, and it's got some kick to it. I do like the flavor, um, but but it, it has it has some good kick to it. And hey, I'm from Arizona, and I also lived in Mexico for a little bit. Your boy knows heat, and it brings some, it brings some real heat to it. So I want to start... Um here my spicy hot take let me i have to put something together so you mind uh just talking for a hot second yeah what do you want me to talk about so i want you to talk about um i know we were talking about leah thomas a little bit oh and see, i have <laughs> here i'll give john's got his his hot take that he's gonna give i'll give my hot take um i i didn't have this prepared john doesn't want you know leah thomas to be associated with jackie robinson i sit on the other side of it i say you know a trailblazer in baseball uh, stadiums, we have 42 retired in all of them. I think uh, to honor Leah Thomas, we should retire Leah Thomas's, well, William Thomas's, uh, uh, William Thomas's Speedo in, in every gym across America for us to remember the, the great trailblazing efforts of Leah Thomas. Oh my gosh, John, what are you doing? I had no idea he was doing this. Yeah, I just want to let you know that I am now going to officially be joining uh, Arizona State uh, women's swim team. And uh, my spicy hot take, though, is even though I dress like a woman and feel like I'm a woman, I am not a woman. And for some reason in our society, that is a spicy hot take that gender is not just some sort of feeling that it's it's they think genders whatever you want it to be and that trans women are women it has nothing to do with chromosomes or anything and i'm here to tell you biology matters and i'm not a biologist but i know what a woman is i might dress like a woman but i'm not a woman i don't know you could have confused me with that hairy chest of a woman you know uh key indicator i could really confuse you if i stood up right now too i was confused please, when please i please don't this is a family show. Yep, but uh, in case you didn't get it, 
my spicy hot take is I might feel like a woman. I might kind of look like a woman, but I am not a woman. Uh, yeah, that is that's a that's a spicy take, John. Um, nah, I mean, let's to to to, to drive the point home, John. You know, if you haven't seen any of those clips, go back and watch some of the video of John going out and talking to people. We live in a society day where we can't even we we are so divided we cannot even agree on something as simple as men are men and women are women. And like we've said a million, you know, many many times before on this show, we honestly wish the absolute best for these people who, who are who are confused who are going through something however it's important to point out the ridiculousness of the arguments being made by by you know the elites and the politicians uh, because no like i mean what, you know i don't i don't have any daughters but if i do one day i want them to be able to go out and compete and not have to deal with the crowd oh this is one thing from from your video that that i was i was laughing at one of the guys in the background is holding a sign that's got a heart and it's got the equality sign. And they do that because, you know, their, their big thing is equality. I thought equality meant fairness. And this is anything but fair that that these women are having to compete with men. There's nothing like having this conversation <laughs> while I'm in this, right? But do we realize how silly this looks? Look at, like, this is silly. This is silly. What I just saw... Uh, this last weekend, and I'm with you. Like, obviously, I'm I'm trying to poke fun at this oh, a little bit, but I'm not saying that anybody should be attacking Leah. I'm more just like, from the grand scheme of things in society, this is silly. It is silly telling people that gender's a feeling. Yeah. That it's your own sort of exper uh, spiritual experience. And Leah Thomas and everybody else that supports that is being deceived. Because, literally... I can say, you know what? I'm the richest person on earth. That doesn't put more money in my bank account. Mm -hmm. Like, do we not realize what, what's going on here and how there's blatant indoctrination going on on these campuses? Because I guarantee you, if I was a men's swimmer and I just dressed up like this and I said I was a woman, those people that I talked to, they'd support me. Oh, yeah, 100%. And it's, and it's sad. Even beard and all. Oh, it's really, really sad. It's unbelievable. I think that's why we need to fight back against this. Leah Thomas isn't some sort of Jackie Robinson. And just like uh, the head coach or the swim coach for Rice University, Seth Houston, we're going to have him on Sunday. Very courageous guy that mm -hmm. has spoke out against this. And we need to hold the NCAA accountable. Remember that. They allowed this because we don't, we don't like it at all. And it's totally unfair. But Leah Thomas did abide by the rules. And those rules were enacted by the NCAA. And then now they're trying to push it off into different governing bodies that like, you know, it's also to breaking down male and female to testosterone or estrogen levels. That's not what we are. Like I can say I'm a woman, but am I gonna get a period? No. Yeah, can I give birth? No. Do I have ovaries? No. Do I produce eggs? Nah. Like what a weird qualification meter. Um, what are people in the chat asking? They want me to show what? Bobs? What the heck's a bob? Oh man, I am not showing any more than this, ladies and gentlemen. You are sick people in the in the comments. Goodness gracious. And it must be pretty wild for everybody that's listening right now. I gotta remember oh. that we have like podcast form. I am in a women's swimsuit with some kids' floaties, and I have a swim cap and some swim goggles. And I'll tell you what, it was awkward going to Target this last week because I actually wanted to dress up like this and be right outside the aquatic center at Georgia Tech and then hold up my sign that said, why are men competing? I didn't end up doing people it. People would have thrown things at you for <laughs> oh, sure. Man, they would have they lost it. I think people would have just like combusted. I think people actually would have just blown up from the inside out. They would have just been poof. That, like they can't, they can't take it anymore. But I, I am dressed like a woman, but I am a man. We'll, we'll post a picture on the on the breakaway, at least uh, on the very least on the story, so y'all can see this. Oh, it's a horrible look. It's it's not good for anybody. But we're gonna wrap up the show uh, with this. A couple of things before before we go is uh, Phil Mickelson's not gonna be playing in the 2022 I Masters. Know. Go Devils! I mean, this is that was heartbreaking for me to read because uh, every time you know he steps up to the tee, uh, by far the person who I support the most because, like I said, go Devils. And then also to world number one Ash Barty. 
is retiring from women's tennis at age 24. 114 straight weeks atop the WTA rankings, fourth longest ever, and explain the reasoning by saying it's just it's the time is right, and it's the time is right to just chase some other dreams. So good for Ash, but I hope that Ash pulls some sort of Tom Brady and comes back after 40 days and 40 nights because women's tennis is better with Ash Barty. Compared. Oh, absolutely. But look, she's made $23 million uh, so far in her career, and she's 25 years old. Like, I mean, yeah, if at 25, she could maybe could... put uh, a Major League Baseball team, she could field one <laughs> with it. <laughs> she could compete with the Orioles. No, but I mean, yeah, if, at 25, if I could have had $23 million and and look, when these when these players retire young, I always love the, what they like. similar to Andrew Luck, where they they really harp on the fact of like, hey, I love this sport. It, but Kerr actually said something very similar on on the show uh, on Sunday where he's like, I love football, but. It's not my entire life. I got a lot. I got a lot of other hobbies. Got a lot of other stuff going on. And so, you know, Ash can take that twenty-three million dollars and go live a great life and explore other avenues. But would love to see her back uh, playing tennis because uh, incredible. Put it in the bank. All right, I got to start heading to the pool. I got to get ready for the next Olympics and this next year's uh, national championships. So don't forget that you can follow us on Instagram at TPUSA Breakaway. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Subscribe to Apple and Spotify podcasts. I got to get out of here because I'm making Brian feel so unbelievably uncomfortable. Appreciate, appreciate you guys very much. And remember, men aren't women and women aren't men. God bless y'all. Later.